And I wrote her a letter of rec. And then this, the college, which was my alma mater, contacted me and said, we don't have enough money in the scholarship. She's d- definitely uh, mm. valued and worth it, but we just don't have enough. And I said, well, how much was the scholarship for? And she said, it was like $200. I said, then I'll write you a check. Oh. And I said, why? I'm like, because I'm very fortunate with, with my career and what I'm doing and, and the privilege that I've had and the opportunities. Welcome to Coffee and Geography, where my guests and I geek out about the world and everything on it, discovering that we are all geographers in some way, shape or form. I'm your host, Kit, and my pronouns are they, them or she, her. So settle down with a brew, hit that subscribe or follow button and enjoy the listen. This podcast is sponsored by the World Energy and Meteorology Council, or WEMSI for short. WEMSI is an international organisation focused on weather and climate data to support energy transition, and we also work with educators. WEMSI have created TEAL, an easy-to-use, free visualisation tool that enables you to explore climate variables for the past 70-plus years. Get started at tealtool.earth. Find us at wemcouncil.org and follow us on Twitter at wemcouncil. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Coffee and Geography. And I am going virtually back over to the United States. I'm really excited to talk about this person because in the green room, we were just talking about like one of the case studies that used to get used in geography teaching over here in the UK, which is the 1994 Northridge earthquake there's a little bit yeah seriously um a little bit dated yeah but um yeah jeremy patridge how are you doing today i'm doing fantastic thank you so much for this opportunity to to connect across the pond as they say (laughs) across the pond and uh, to a part of the world i know fairly fairly well um a little bit further north perhaps we'll talk about this a bit later because i spent a bit of time in in san francisco so um um, and did come over to like the la area as a tourist like when i was 13 i think but anyway so to introduce you uh professor jeremy patridge is the backyard geographer and that's in caps so i'm gonna ask you to explain that one in a minute the backyard geographer he has taught um hundreds of geography and geology courses at colleges universities across the state of california it's a big state so that's that's a good achievement and has taken thousands of students on field trips to explore the geography in our backyards the pandemic has changed the way that educators interact and inspire their students and with the help of friends and youtube jeremy has found a new way to engage with students around the world and this is good we're definitely going to go with this a bit later in addition to loving the earth sciences he is a disney historian nerd alert and, uh, very. Co- <laughs> yeah. and collector of Disney art, vintage Americana, and pop culture items. Uh, what to pick up first? Okay, first of all, let's go back to the start. Backyard geographer, capital B, capital G. Obviously, a very important title for you. It, it was uh, yes, because at the beginning, I um, when I first started teaching, I needed a. Uh, a hashtag that I could share with my students to show that I was cool, you know? Uh, and so I was using Cal geog, which was California geographer. And then when, as time progressed, as years went by more recently during the pandemic, actually, it's so the last couple of years, um, I found that what I was contributing to our discipline was no longer limited to California. Um, it was across the world and that was blowing my mind. And I realized that what people kept implying to me is that I was uh, providing them an opportunity to learn geography in their backyard, that it's there. Like while we were stuck at home in lockdown, that we were stuck at home, but your backyard is the gateway to the world, whether it be you're looking at weather or climate or uh, geomorphology, you can see um, your entire community in your backyard. And so that kind of picked up my thing is that I'm also like the backyard geographer that, you know, that we, we're not limited to just, you know, a spot that it, we can see and, and observe anything uh, in our lifetime found just in our backyards. We just don't realize what's really there. And so that's what kind of started that whole thing. And I think it's been an opportunity that we as, as geography educators have to grasp because not everybody has a backyard. Not everybody has a space, a private space or a space that they can explore to themselves. But 
there is still an opportunity to kind of get really, really deep to explore your low, you know, your local neighborhoods. It could be an urban environment. It could be a rural environment. It could be the moss on your step. It could be the spider web, the spider weaving its web, you know, in the corner of your door frame. You Absolutely. know, all these kinds of things. And I do think that quite a fair few geography educators have like really captured that. And there's been a lot of people I've spoken to now. I mean, you this may be the 50th episode, Jeremy. I don't know. It could all be getting very, very close <laughs> to it. But I've now had so many chats where there's been a lot of talk about reconnecting with nature and not just nature right. as in you know, the global biosphere, but our own personal spaces, you know, that within our personal mm-hmm. geographies. So that's absolutely. that's absolutely fantastic. And and there are a lot of silver and the pandemic has been tragic tragic for a lot of people, but there has been a lot of silver linings that we must hopefully take and move forward with. So um California's a big place. What okay, I'll tell you what, <laughs> let's skip straight to kind of like where you are in your location. What is a backyard in California? I know I've got friends in San Francisco where they don't even have backyards. And I've got right. friends in California where they have huge backyards. And California is a massive state. So what would be considered a backyard, a classic quintessential backyard in California? Uh, it sounds like a simple question, but – California is incredibly diverse. Mm. We're one of the few places where you can go surfing and snowboarding in the same day. Um, that we have five major climate groups within our state uh, for the Copen climate classification. So yeah. a backyard can be incredibly diverse. Uh, but I think it just really depends on what part of the state you're on. Like where I live, I'm in a, a smaller community called Valverde, which uh, is – it has its own cultural importance in California history. Uh, it was the the Black Palm Springs of the 1940s and 50s because during that time, California was still dealing with segregation and movie stars were, you know, people of color were not allowed in Palm right. Springs, which was okay. this big desert community. So this was its own version of Palm Springs, a little much farther north and west. We're about, uh, about 40 miles from the ocean, the Pacific Ocean here. But we had cabins and hunting lodges. And so we've got that cultural aspect, but also we have a lot of marine sediments that, you know, when California, you know, dealing with just tectonics and, and all of that, I mean, this whole area was under the ocean for, you know, right, for, you yeah. know, fact, you know yeah. that's a whole other conversation. So, but I mean, you can literally walk down the street into the wash and pick up, you know, seashells that are, you know, you know, 300,000 plus years old, but not that old in some cases, but to be able to pick up that, you know, when, when you're not that close to the ocean, it's just so, it's so diverse. And then I've got friends who live again, farther North in the Bay area and their backyard, they don't have one. So their backyard is their front yard, right. it's whatever they make of it. Or, or in the some roof cases, of the building, the roof of what they can observe. And I, yeah. I have many students that are, you know, that are perhaps in a wheelchair, so they can't go on a field trip. So their backyard are my virtual field trips that I took myself recording myself at, you know, death Valley, the one of the arguably the hottest place on earth. So their backyard is something that they physically can't experience, but virtually is limitless. They're able to be integrated into those zones and to be able to make that their space. Because I mean, that's what geography is, it's space, it's spatial. So what is your space or place? And like you said, it could be, you know, literally a, a small little backyard, front yard, a rooftop, a patio. I mean, I know geographers who all they have is their apartment and a little box of their garden. And that's their opportunity yeah. to just feel the soil, you know, and just, you know, have their tomato plant or their basil and that's their backyard. But that opens you up to the world, right? Absolutely. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad you answered that question far better than I asked it because I was going for kind of almost like the philosophical metaphorical kind oh. of backyard rather than, <laughs> rather than the physical backyard. Cause I, so no, that was a brilliant answer. Jeremy, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm thinking. So in San Francisco, we've got my cousin who has her the house that she lives in is actually like split into three apartments. That's another thing that's quite common, especially in very expensive areas to live. So she lives right. in Emeryville, which is just north oh, of wonderful. Oakland. Yeah, yeah. But, it's, but the property prices are ridiculous. Explains um, why you're a nerd because it's so close to Pixar in Emeryville. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, 
so that so okay. their their house is actually three split into three apartments and they've got pretty much a courtyard um kind of garden kind of thing and you're right she does the same things like potted plants and stuff all that as much as she can and then my um one of my best friends who lives in the bay area well just, yeah in in the bay area just in the south of san francisco all they have is a balcony mm. and they put some plants and stuff like that um and then you go out to Haywood, where we stayed in an Airbnb for a couple of weeks. <laughs> it got quite a big backyard, actually. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, it's fantastic. And um, and you talk about the climate and, like, even the bay is its own microclimate with the way that the, the fog comes in and the difference of the air, the air pressure and the air differential and brings that moisture out. Oh, it's just so gorgeous. Um, and then you talk about the geology, like, you know, it used to be under the sea, then an inland sea, you know. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jeremy. And people who are listening to this have got to picture this. So if you think of the state of California, I like to think of yes. the spine of it where you've got the the highlands, the mountains, the hills, you know, with Sequoia National Forest on it, Sierra National, all, the, the Yosemite, all those kind of things. And then you've got the valley where you've got yes. Bakersfield to the south going through Fresno up to Sacramento. That was a massive inland sea for a fairly long time. Am I correct? Am I remembering That's that right? That's correct. Yes. Right. Yeah. So I mean, you know, if you go farther back, the you know, the ocean was all the way to Utah uh, at one point until the Farallon Plate, which was in the middle, was subducted. But I mean, just up until ten thousand years ago, the Central Valley was uh, the main corridor for you know early Americans, the indigenous that were here, that they were taking their balsam boats and traveling the center of the state uh, for trade. Uh, oh. we had that then so it's not uncommon to see but i mean even like in the sierra nevada which is really the backbone of our state um you know the uh over 400 miles of just the world's hardest granite (laughs) is incredible (laughs) but to then find that within those ranges that are opposite to it you know as an example to the east of the sierra nevada there's another mountain range the inyo and the inyo has uh Ammonite fossils that have been dated to be over 300 million years old. So to the, just think that, wait a minute, at one point, all of that was underwater. Then you have the uplift of this mighty Sierra Nevada that essentially separates the, the state east to west, which pushes all the ocean outward you know, towards the west. And then, you know, keeping those flood, you know, that, that flooded zone, which is now our hearth of agriculture, uh, you know, now that the water's all gone, but it's because of all the settling material after glaciation and, and all that. Mm. It's the hearth of our agriculture for, the, for not just California. But the United States, I mean, we are, other than Mexico, we are the number one producer of avocados in the world, citrus, almonds, yes. nuts, you know, you know, it's incredible what we can produce in our state and because of those regions that at one point were underneath, you know, basins of water. Yeah, it's incredible. It's such incredible. And this is why I've, you know, we could go on to a whole podcast episode about just talking about California and its diversity and what it does. And, and of course, the future of the state, you know, with, with, with climate change and everything, it was just, we could just go down a rabbit hole with this. And I would so wish to, <laughs> right. if it wasn't already nine to 10 at night, 10 to nine at night. Um, okay. I'm going to swiftly move on before we go down a rabbit hole and come Sorry, back yes. to. Never apologize, Jeremy. No, <laughs> no. There, like, in fact, there are people like shouting at their, their iPhone, or I almost said iPod, that's showing my age. Um, <laughs> on their MP3 player. Yeah, whatever, an MP3 player saying, <laughs> Get, no, we want to hear more, we want to hear more. But trust me, folks, there is so much gross stuff we're going to talk about. And you'll be able to connect with Jeremy after this and have at it. Um, so, Coffee and Geography, the name, Brew. Do you have a, a drink with you at the moment, or what do you usually drink when I you do. sit down and have a chat with a friend or... You know, I don't, I don't drink coffee, so don't judge me. It gives me indigestion. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So I, I love uh, iced tea. So I'm actually drinking uh, black tea. I, I'm in the process of moving, so I didn't have my normal oh. tea. So I ran to Starbucks, which is <laughs> I hate it, but it's local, and so I got. So I had them get my my black tea in my. It's actually my California glassware. It's got all of the iconic. Highway 395, which is that backbone of California with all the special places, Mono Lake and all that stuff on it. So black oh, tea with a little bit of sweetener. Okay. All right, everybody. I'm going to I'm gonna confess. I'm going to confess. I am a tea snob. So when it comes to <laughs> Lipton, I can't touch Lipton. I can't touch it. I just can't. It has to be, you know, the, the British tea, all that kind of stuff. Yes, Certainly. I'm showing my colonial kind of 
heritage here. Um, but I must admit, when I when I lived in San Francisco for a little bit, and I started to have uh, the people I was living in, somebody's back garden where they had an RV. I was living in their RV for two months, it, and they would bring me kombucha, just okay. that they make themselves, and I just I got hooked on it. So it was fermented and brewed itself and all that kind of stuff. And I loved it. And then after being hooked on kombucha, I did then slip a little bit into the iced tea, something I never, <laughs> ever thought I could. So everyone now, all of my friends over here are disowning me. Kit, you have gone to the dark side. It's got to be hot with milk. and you're... So I admit I've gone down that rabbit hole now as myself. <laughs> There's a time and place. I love sun brew tea, and that's really common in California. With yeah, tea. sun. That's, that's what the other thing I was thinking. Sun brew tea, yeah, is the best. But, but I understand. I won't judge you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I have an ally here. I have, a, I have an ally, and all my other friends over here can. can you only on need one hand. ally, right? You know, that's how you start. <laughs> this is very true. This is very true. <laughs> brilliant, right? So, <clears throat> let's let's talk a little bit more. Let's geek out about geography. We're going to geek out about quite a few things. We're going to get back onto you being a nerd for Disney a bit later. Of course. Right. So um, there's a few things here that I'm really, really interested in. You said geology. You said about earthquakes and that that always, always um, really, really kind of captivates people here. It's something that the students really, really enjoy, you know, natural hazards, things like that because of the awe and wonder. There's this – I've recently written an article um, for Teaching Geography Journal – um, with regards to trying to use what we learn about natural hazards, the processes, the impacts to build empathy within geography through a geography lens, through critical thinking and all this kind of stuff. And I know you've mentioned in your thing here that you, you, you enjoy that kind of aspect of, of learning and teaching about critical thinking. There's a question I really want to ask you, uh, Jeremy, is this, how to put this, with all the awe and the wonder that physical processes can bring and they you know the power of earthquakes volcanoes any tectonic hazard even you know uh weather hazards climate hazards how do you teach them yourself in a way where where you where you you or your students don't get carried away by the spectacle and you Mm. kind of bear in mind that these things can cause tragedy if people are not in the right place, because we know that these things are natural occurrences. It's the people that get in the way sure. um, and all their circumstances and stuff. How, how, how do you do that? What, 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 how do you kind of manage that? Oh, that's excellent. So um, living in California, <laughs> yes. I, I can take them to faults. I can take them. We're not that far from the San Andreas fault, which is you know, the Mecca of faulting when we can observe it. I can take them to hot springs and extinct volcanoes that are within relative uh, distance to where we are. So I feel for myself, the first thing is that I need to remove the the traditional fear of, you know, the earth is going to do what it needs to do because it's a process, period. So to remove that fear, to then get them excited to learn more. But then once they're excited about that process, then you add in the element. Okay. So now as humans, what's like for earthquakes, earthquakes don't kill people. It's they're terrifying, but they don't kill people. It's the things that we've done, the buildings, the structures, where we've moved, where we put things, that's the issue. And so to create that knowledge base, so then they can make that decision for themselves and go, wait a minute, why is there a community living along the San Andreas Fault? And I go, that's a great question because I want to know as well. You know, yeah. does it doesn't make sense to me that you know, if we know that this hazard is occurring, that there is motion, there is uh, release of tension and stress, why would you want to live that close? And it's like, well, I don't know. That's a great question. I don't understand why someone signed that off. And then we can create that conversation of understanding. But I think that to – we're so fortunate that we can see it. We can touch it. We, we can visit these locations, which does, I mean, it creates this, this magical feeling that you can see that you can literally walk back and forth between a plate boundary and say that yeah. you're on two different masses <laughs> is incredible. But in, in to create that knowledge base, but then to also say, well, you know, this is how it operates. This is how it works. And this is what we know about it. And when we do see the hazard aspect of it, you know, 
why why is there a hazard? You know, well, because we built buildings along a coastline when we know that we shouldn't. Well, but why do we do that? Well, because people want that view, but they couldn't get that anywhere else. And so I think that that critical thinking aspect is what where I go with, because if you give them enough knowledge and let them make their own decisions, I'm, my favorite two terms to use in my classrooms are observation and interpretation, is that the observation is what you're seeing. And I can't change that. That's what you're feeling. So I can give you tools to you know, observe it differently. But what you're seeing is what you see. And the interpretation is a hard part because I tell them your interpretation is how do you explain it to someone without a bias? You're, you're talking yes, on the phone. Yeah. How do you describe what you're seeing to be as genuine as you possibly can without adding any emotion? or And so giving them the tools to be able to learn how to observe critically and correctly they're able to then make their own interpretation that that's what I'm assessing is like, well, do you get it? Do you really understand that? And that's, that's where I try to lead them to. It's, and this whole thing is something that educators grapple with because yeah, there's this pressure of getting through whatever curriculum there is, there's this pressure of like, kind right. of like having knowledge and all that kind of stuff. But you're right. Like the interpretation is so important, which is why, critical thinking skills is so important and <clears throat> there's one thing i've been trying to help teachers with over here is getting them giving them the tools and the awareness to be well giving them the tools to be aware of their bias and helping their students to be aware of their bias right. not necessarily to you know com- overcome it or whatnot but if you're aware of it then you can and you can make more um poignant observation or interpretation sorry you make more um interpretations because okay well that interpretation has come from this place and i accept that so but now i am willing to hear to other interpretations because it may come from another point of view and then and then those discussions right. take place and yeah the word discussion is like i would add i would probably add discussion to your two so you yeah. know discussion you know probably but all of that creates sympathy empathy, yes. understanding, and then creates open-ended questions of like, well, wait a minute, now that now that I understand this, like I one of my favorite moments teaching at the beginning when I first started, I got a random email from a student that had taken a class a long time ago. And she said, it was like really early in the morning. She says, there are alluvial fans on Mars. She says, there, that means there must have been water, right? And I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> you got it. Like you got it. Like you took what we learned and time had gone by a substantial amount of time. Yes. <laughs> and you were able to then, when we first started getting this clear imagery of Mars, you were able to put it all together and you were able to interpret that and explain it to me. And I was just, I was blown away and I was like, wow, <laughs> it does, it works. <laughs> yeah. So that gives me hope because in my, in my dream, I'm, I'm a Trek nerd, right? And a sci-fi nerd. So, I said, people say to me, Kit, if you could have any job whatsoever that you would <laughs> wish, what would you have? I said, an exogeographer. So oh. somebody who does what a geographer does, yeah. but with other planets and other places in the Milky Way and the galaxy and whatnot. Like I can imagine myself being a member of the science division on a starship, being their exogeographer specialist. And that's the kind of thing. So if your yeah. student do that, oh, there's alluvial fans on Mars, Mars, it means it must be water. It's like, then I can quite clearly go to other planets in the galaxy and do the same sort of thing with my geography skills. I don't see that as a dream. I mean, I think that we've got enough people right now that are reinterested in the final frontier. And yes. I don't think that is that far off. I, I, there, there will be a need, right? With anything, with anywhere we go, you know, you need that spatial thinker that can relate it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, the, one of the best things about things like this is head cannon. In my head cannon, I am out there somewhere on a starship. I'm probably on probably on one of the the lower decker kind of starships, maybe. But that's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's fine. I'm up there doing my thing. Um, but yeah, it's coming back to what you're saying about it's critical thinking um, stuff. It's it's just so so important, and it and it is over here in the UK, and particularly. I mean, you might be able to comment about how it is in the states. I know it's. I know it may be different from different parts of the states as well, because the not just the diversity of geography in the states, the diversity right. of the approaches to education and the politics, and the fact that you know California is quite progressive when it comes to science education. But you go somewhere else, they don't want to be talking about evolution. Anyway, enough of that kit. <laughs> but here, they they really do want to drive forward with critical thinking and like the decolonial movement over here in education is pretty strong. 
for example, right. even though the government are trying to push back on that. And um, and yeah, but so to talk about natural hazards and natural processes, but you're still able to take a critical thinking lens with a natural process, that really excites me. It really does. It, it just goes to show the intersectionality of geography. Absolutely. And, and you know, then the cultural aspect. I mean, I'm where I live, we are 10 miles from what's it's called the St. Francis Dam, which was California's greatest man-made natural disaster in history, killing upwards to 600 people. We don't know how many people actually died when the dam broke. I can take them there. And the reason it broke, there's a lot of reasons. Geology played a role in it. Also, putting too much water behind the dam because there was an understanding on, on that and how that worked. But something that is you know, now almost 100 years later, I can still take them there and we can learn and understand and then try to paint that cultural picture of who was here, what, what peoples were here, why were they here, were they farmers, were they ranchers? And uh, it's just, you're right, we could talk forever on these things. And, but just to be that close that I can bring in so many different attributes of whether they be man-made or natural disasters in my community, and then I can share it across the state and other places. It's what makes it exciting because then you get their input because I'm sure in your curriculum where you are, I mean, you know, maybe not so much the 94 earthquake anymore, but probably when you and I were in school, that was a really big thing. But oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. the San Andreas Fault, I mean, that's people from around the world come there and to, and to Mount Whitney, which is our tallest point. And my students, I have students, I'm, I'm 35, 40 minutes from the beach. I have students who have never seen the ocean still. Yeah, which blows my mind. Yep. But to say, but to take them to Mount Whitney to the base and say, this is our Everest, fourteen thousand, you know, five hundred and eight feet or whatever it is at the time. And they, wow, really? It's like, yeah. And you can take an hour and a half going to the east, and I can take you to the lowest point in Death Valley at negative yeah. two hundred eighty-two feet in sea level. You know, talk about fire and ice, you know, the polar yes. opposites of two things, and you can almost see them from one another. It's just, it's incredible. Yeah, and educators listening, and a lot of our audience are educators and geography in particular. That power of taking our students to an unfamiliar place is just, you know, it's. I I was so lucky to bring a small group of students to the Yellowstone National Park area um, Mm. because of my connections to the to that area of the of of the USA, and. I just said to my my family who have a house there out in Bozeman, Montana, like, oh, this would be a great place for a field trip based on it. Laugh, 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 joke, joke, joke. And then I actually said, you know what? Yeah, actually, you should do that, kid. That's a really good idea. And so we fundraised. We got kids out there. And <clears throat> we arrived at night. Um, everyone was jet lagged, went straight to bed, and then woke up in the morning. And when they looked out the window of the house for the first time in the daylight, they right. were just because of seeing those mountains, the glacial valley and the trough and everything. It was just, and for you're right, even here in the United Kingdom, where we're supposed to be a seafaring nation, there are kids who've never seen the coast here, right? you know, or have not even stepped out of their local town, city. So right. taking them to an environment which is slightly different to what they're used to, it's so powerful. And, but that's, yeah. and that's experiential learning. That's something yeah. that those students will never forget. I get emails or, or Instagram 100%. messages from students from 10 years ago that said, hey, I wanted a field trip with you. And I just want you to know that, you know, I still think of that. And I'm like, wow, yeah. like, really that weekend trip that I took you to go see these things has left an impact on your your thought process, your mind, your soul. Like this is something that will always be with you. you no money can buy that. In that yeah. experience and and totally. that's what geography is about is that that experience and that experiential learning because the more that we experience the more knowledge we have and really the better humans we become yeah, because we totally agree. can speak better to what you know not to get into a whole other thing but you know just learning about my privilege i've got i have male privilege white privilege i've got all these things academic i mean i'm so fortunate in so many ways so how do i pay it back and how do i let people know I, I acknowledge what I have and what I've earned, but what I what I was born with too. And how can I bring you with me to make you feel included? And you know, and that's what I find yeah. in my academics is I'm pulling people with me because I know that the reward will be a lifetime of difference. 
Oh, Jeremy, I love that because I, I, I like to take a positive approach to privilege and I've had many privilege checks in my life. What, you know, one in particular was when I first went to the continent of Africa. So visiting South mm. Africa, first of all, in 2003 and then visiting Malawi in 2013 on teacher exchange, having real privilege checks in that respect. Right. Um, and I just love the way you put that, paying it forward. It's like that is because because privilege doesn't say, you know, being say you've got privilege, you need to do something about it. It doesn't need to be a threatening thing. You know, if you've got, it it could be a positive thing. It could be a force for good. So like, and I just love that. I'm going to use that from now on everybody paying your privilege forward. This is what you've, 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 you're lucky enough to have this in life. How are you going to pay it forward? I love that. Oh, thank you for gracing that. It makes such a difference. As an example, I had a student who had emailed me that she was going to a local university and she was applying for a scholarship. And they're very small amounts. They were just a couple hundred dollars. And I wrote her a letter of rec. And then this, the college, which was my alma mater, contacted me and said, we don't have enough money in the scholarship. She's d- definitely uh, mm. valued and worth it, but we just don't have enough. And I said, well, how much was the scholarship for? And she said, it was like $200. I said, then I'll write you a check. Oh. And I said, why? I'm like, because I'm very fortunate with, with my career and what I'm doing and, and the privilege that I've had and the opportunities. So I, every, every semester I donate to their scholarship fund knowing that I'm, that that little bit of money that isn't, I mean, that would have been uh, a fancy dinner <laughs> somewhere with, with yeah, me and my family yeah. that could make or break a student's opportunity to further their education. Cause I still have a majority of my students are first generation, single parents, you know, just trying to get into academics and, you know, you don't realize what a little bit of money, your coffee fund, what that could do for someone else, you know? And so that's how I pay it forward. I always do stuff like that because amazing. it's not just the right thing to do. It's, it's an opportunity that I'm sharing with someone else and I'm paying, I'm giving it out and I'm sharing my privilege with other people to get, try to inspire them that they're not alone and that they're included and that they have value. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and, and it never, it doesn't have to always be about money as well. For it could be no. using time. your connections, using your time. Yeah. So like it's, Oh, I know someone who might be able to support you with this. Let me put you in touch with them, you know, right. you, cause, because the other privilege that, I guess folks like have, has, us have as well, especially through academia and our networks, is that mm-hmm. we're quite well connected. So why not use those connections to kind of give someone else a, um, a boost? And I've, I have an ex-student now who is um, working in the renewable in- energy industry because of someone I put them in contact with, just just as a, yeah, you know, you'll find this person interesting, and they two years down the line they end up with a job with them. So it's like brilliant. But isn't that insane to think that one conversation that you had? Yes change the trajectory of someone's life forever yeah yeah i mean that's incredible it was i I can tell you that i can tell you the circumstances it was it was they just graduated and they said i want to get in this industry how do i do it and and i think it was the best thing to do actually is just to get your foot in the door like becoming an ad you know if there's a job as an admin staff for an industry a business that you Mm -hmm. want to get into go for it and then speak about and then tell them what your passions are, like what you would hope to do is like, maybe one day I'd be able to go out on site visits, do surveying for you, not, you know, as well as, and that's exactly what happened. And I just brought, I said, yeah, this person's interested, you know, what do you think? Have them on. So, yeah. So I got the admin job. And now I think they're kind of something like, like a manager or a supervisor of some kind of like their wow. project work, like wow. starting off as a receptionist. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> freaking yes. So yeah. yeah, exactly, Jeremy. And I, I, I absolutely love that. And to circle back now, to bring this back and circle back with regards to experiences, you know, it doesn't have to be the Yellowstones or the San Andreas Fault or Death Valley. It can also, it can be just simply something just five miles away, 10 miles away, which is completely different to their everyday experience. It could change right. something. And I get students come, I get students who go um, um, to me, it's like, oh, like, I always remember the Castle Acre trip in year seven in sixth grade, right? And the Castle Acre is this little tiny village with like a ruined castle and an old church. And you just walk around the village and see how it's changed over time because of the car and everything, you know, services. Right. That's all it. So, from my point of view, we go and visit this place, place like this with the kids and the family. It's just a day out. But for some of these kids, it's like, whoa, I was like, I've not seen anything like this, this old ruined castle or this village or realize that everybody's reliant on the car. And they go, 10 years later, like, I remember the Castle Lake trip. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, even the little ones like that, quote, unquote, always, little ones. 
Yeah. Because you never know. You never know what you say, what you do, where you are. Yeah, it's brilliant. Hi, folks. A chance for you to recharge your brew, but also a polite prod to remind you that it's so easy to support this podcast. Simply liking, sharing, rating, and reviewing means that it will get on more people's radar. Also, there are a few links down in the description which may be of mutual benefit. Please do check them out. Right. I'm really excited to move on to this next bit now. Um, <laughs> yes. So um, I'm going to do something a bit strange here. Well, a bit, I'm going to merge two features of the podcast. I'm going to merge Spill the Beans and Barking Up the Wrong Tree. Right. <laughs> so spill the beans is when you tell us something which is quite quirky about yourself. And bark up the wrong tree is where you've got to try and establish which one it is. I don't think I'm going to fool you with this one because of what you said in your bio, which is a Disney historian. <laughs> no, 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 you're stressing me out. You're stressing me out. <laughs> no, it's all a fun. It's all a bit of fun. So you said here that um, you've got a passion for Disney, the art, the people, the culture. It fascinates yeah. you to the point that your first job ever was working for the Disney company. And you collect art, statues, books. And you have some incredible Imagineers and could possibly write a book of your own experience. Ah, oh. right. Is there anything I can see in your? Have you got anything to hand? You oh. can grab Disney wise. You got a beautiful map of California oh. behind you, but oh, thank you. You know, here I'll grab this. So Jerry's just oh. shuffling, just reaching off screen, and pulls a picture. Okay, it's got a bit. Pi oh, oh my God, that's beautiful, Mowgli. Mowgli. So this is an original production cell from the Jungle Book. Oh. Uh, now you're, now you're going to love this as a geographer. So this is, this was used, but in the corner, it's hard to see. Yep. There's an autograph and it says Floyd Norman. Floyd Norman uh, was is a famous animator from the Walt Disney Company and other studios. Walt personally hired him and he was the first African-American oh, animator. Sweet. And so that was one of his uh, first – he worked – actually, his first film that he worked on was Fantasia, but that was one of the ones he worked mostly uh, – <laughs> on Mowgli itself was uh, Floyd Norman. So that's one thing that I have within grasp that, that I've got others. <laughs> oh no, I've got songs going through my head now. So like, that's okay. Look for the bare necessities, bare necessities. The simple <laughs> bare necessities. Forget about your worries or your strife. Yeah, man, I had to get yeah. started. Um, that's okay. <laughs> uh, hey, so I'm, I'm running. So, but, okay. Okay. Um, I, I haven't seen a land jungle book for ages. Right. Okay. So this is what we're going to do, right? So in terms of the spill of beans, we're talking about Disney, and we can carry on with that in a second. But bark up the wrong tree. I'm going to give. Okay. I'm going to read out two stories. Well, things about Disney movies, right? One of them is Oof. false, and one of them is true. Okay. Um, I, I, I think I, I, I tried to make this like difficult for you, but. For the listeners, I didn't want to make it too difficult. <laughs> so you, 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 I think, I think you, I honestly think you're gonna, you'll be fine with this. So really, this is a challenge for the listeners. Okay, folks. Okay. Are you ready for this? Right. So which one of these is false? So we're gonna, we're gonna hear a little bit about the Little Mermaid and Mulan. Okay. Right? First of all, Little Little Mermaid. Is this true or is this a myth? Is this false? Little Mermaid, in the Disney version of, of this Hans Christian Andersen's tale, Ariel eventually wins the heart of Prince Eric's and gets her voice back and celebrates with a beautiful wedding on a boat surrounded by her aquatic friends and family. But in Hans Christian Andersen's original story, it doesn't end so rosy. In fact, the story is a tragic throughout, with Ariel's transformation to a human causing her consistent agonizing pain before her heart is broken when the prince actually marries someone else. And the sea witch informs that if she kills the prince, she will turn back into a mermaid and live, but instead she chooses to sacrifice herself, throwing herself into the sea and becoming sea foam. So that's Little Mermaid. Is that true or is that a myth? And the second one, so here's, here's Mulan, right? So Mulan is based on the story of Lady Fu Hao, who was one of 60 wives of the Emperor Wu Ding in the ancient China Shang dynasty. She broke with tradition by serving both as high priestess and posing as a military general. Now, according to inscriptions on oracle bones from the time, Fu Hao led, to many, uh, led many military campaigns, commanded 13,000 soldiers, and was considered the most powerful military leaders of her time, and was only after a number of successful sorties that her true identity was discovered, but she was so revered that she continued as a military general. Um, 
So there's the one of Mulan. Oh. So one of them is false and one of them is true. See, I've got no, you I just feel like you. Yeah, you do. I mean, my first my first feeling is that uh, the anecdote about Ariel is true and that Mulan is false. But I just that's my I don't know. That's those are really excellent, well put <laughs> anecdotes. <laughs> well, one so I slightly reword them to see it to try and not get get it too obvious. But um, yeah, so I mean, I I know that Disney have well. Let's let's talk a bit about why I came up with this this fun thing game. It's because Disney try to take historical events, truish people, fairy tales, and they make it their own story. But perhaps you can tell us, Jeremy, is they're very controversial with their their interpretation of history through their stories, through their cartoons, through their films. Mm-hmm. So do you have any particular examples of which? Or maybe it could be a, a family, a, a favorite of yours or, or a movie or something? You know, it's uh, – uh, you know, on Walt's desk right before he died, uh, the Little Mermaid was one of the stories on his desk. So it wasn't a new – topic that they were going to it took a while of course but i think that the most iconic that's like the first that comes off my mind is song of the south um as being right, yes a film that has you know it, it, as a geographer how we view that film in its space and place and time and the stories that it's telling does it have racial undertones absolutely but yeah almost every media at that time that there was but when you, not, a, not as a spoiler alert, but at the end of that movie, uh, when Uncle Remus and the small boy are holding hands on film to the world, that was huge. No, I mean, you didn't see stuff like that. I mean, you know, what, what I think was it Betty White? She got canceled because she let, I think it was Nat King Cole sing extra on her show. It was one of those mm. famous stars. You know, it's just, you know, that wasn't common at that time, which is very frustrating but you you can't you have to acknowledge it it's what it was and you can't hide from it either because if yeah. you hide from your past it's just going to come back and find you again but you hide from your but, past you bite you in the ass yeah exactly <laughs> and yep. so i think like song of the south is an incredible um op- like idea within that but i mean you know when you're talking about all your other stories i mean walt always aimed towards the happily ever after yeah. Because most of these stories were grim, as we know, uh, <laughs> figuratively and literally. And, you know, they're, it's not going to sell at the movie theater and people want to be entertained. And so um, to, to manipulate those stories to a happily ever after, yet you lose a lot of the original intention and the meaning. You know, that goes back to, well, even just with going back to Uncle Remus with those stories mm. that were told. I mean, those were real stories, but they were adapted for film and they were kind of changed and they added different characters and voices yeah. and dialects. And, and so, you know, it, it's, it's always been uh, a very thin line that was walked uh, by any industry within that, you know, but I think that it's so important for us to, to, to acknowledge. And we were just talking, it's a group of us were just talking about Snow White. Cause there's supposed to be, there was like some new Snow White movie that was in the pipeline. And, you know, and they were, there was conversation about how Snow White was white. So while well, she was German, I mean, I don't, I don't know what, like, what you can do about that, but I understand how you want to tell the same story uh, using different cultural influences and, and maybe trying to retell it in a different way that might be more relevant to the people that are going to watch it today. Like I totally acknowledge that, but it's at the same time, it's like you have to also recognize the original stories and where they took place, who they took place from and why. But um yeah, it, it's definitely a fine line that was that's walked on a lot of different attributes. But you know, my you know, going back to Song of the South, I guess I do love talking about that with some folks because the ones with the biggest opinions on it have never seen it because it hasn't been viewable here in the United States for well almost two decades. I don't think it's wow. the last time it was released in the uh, early '90s on a VHS, and so it's not available and so you're taking your interpretation of what it was on splash mountain which was an attraction that was themed after that movie um, yes. and you're you know taking that and the voices and the dialects and trying to piece everything together and, and, Spl- and splash mountain's a whole other conversation because yeah. that was not even that was america sings moved it was a uh, another attraction that was once there and all the characters were literally unbolted and moved but what i will um, do i'll interject there jeremy and say people should listen to <laughs> season one episode 27 with Ro proctor 
um, who talked about the cultural appropriation of Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox, and the sto- the, the quote unquote real story behind Splash Mountain. So right. everyone should listen to that because it's a freaking. I, I, I didn't. It blew my mind. It blew my mind. Anyway. <laughs> No, but absolutely. So, I mean, I think that, you know, like I said, there's just a lot of um, awareness that needs to be made. But again, you can't uh, you can't hide from these things, you know, because if you hide from it, it's just it's embarrassing. You know, you need to be able to, to talk about it because if you can talk about it, you can learn from it. Yes. But people don't want to talk. They'd rather fight and ignore and erase. And it just doesn't work well that way, as we've seen culturally and politically over the last couple of years. So a friend of mine, used to, a friend of mine in, in the decolonizing geography group said it perfectly. It's like the conversation never ends; it only evolves. But you've got to have the conversation in the first place. You know, right. the conversation will never stop, and that's perfect. And you've got to be prepared for that. And when people don't even want the conversation, then you know you're on a hiding to nothing because because it won't. You know, and they, yeah. they, that's, that's probably what they fear. They fear that fact that they probably know deep down it it, it shouldn't end and it never ends. Um, cause we should always be evolving, but going back to the, the barking up the wrong tree, I think you, without realizing it, you talked yourself into the correct answer, right? And that oh, is probably. you, you talk, <laughs> you talked about the fact that many of the Disney stories, if you take, go to their true roots, they are pretty grim. And yes. <laughs> so, um, so one of the stories I said, does have a grim ending in in quote unquote you know its basis the other one actually it was more of a glory story in its basis so if you go with that instinct you can get which one is the true and which one is the false so what do you reckon see you're still stressing that i'm gonna stick with um <laughs> i'm gonna stick with little mermaid as being true that's yeah <laughs> <laughs> well you can calm your nerves um and sip on your starbucks Ice tea because uh, yeah you're absolutely right. So the little mermaid oh, one. So that the Hans Christian Andersen uh, st- is based, which it's story, which is based on Ariel meets a very drastic end because she doesn't want to kill the prince, so she sacrifices herself to become Seafone. And actually, the the Mulan one, what I've done is that I took a true historical figure, Lady Fu Hao, but has nothing to do with Mulan. You know that story oh, was sneaky, and so. <laughs> Let me, I know. I, I added in the fact that she was posing as a military general. That bit's false. She actually was a right. high priestess and a military general. They knew it. She wasn't covert or anything like that. She was a military general and a high priestess. Hmm. Um, so she wasn't covert at all. She was, and it says on it says on the thing here. Uh, and everybody, I'll put the link in the description so you see all these things. So Lady Fu Fu Hao, right? The many weapons found in her tomb tomb support her status as a great female warrior she also controlled her, her own fiefdom on the outskirts of her husband's empire and her tomb was unearthed in 1976 and can be visited by the public so oh. uh, yeah and um the other thing i'll put in the description as well is is the real controversial kind of backstory to to mulan the disney movie and it is such a fascinating read um of course the other thing we could talk about could link in some bits we've already talked about in the past is Pocahontas. Oh. <laughs> seen Jamie's face. Everybody's like, oh, don't. <laughs> so we'll we'll let you read that one up, everybody. Yeah, that's that's just a little bit. We'll put it this way. Um, I don't know, is, is it? Is, is, do you say spoilers when you say a true historical event? What happened? I can't say sp- it's not like- I mean, no, the Titanic sank. It's not a spoiler alert. Like we know what's going to happen, so you know the yeah. truth. Yeah. Well, Pocahontas <laughs> ended up. Ended up back in England and dying at the age of twenty. Uh, yes, so tragic end. Um, right, let's go back to a bit of a positive, fun note now. <laughs> <laughs> but that was fun. Thanks for that. Um, right, so uh, finish off, Jeremy, with we are all geographers. Um, linking, let's link you up with our previous guest from last week. Um, I had a wonderful time, wonderful time. And I mentioned Malawi already previously, talking to one of my bestest friends, Francis Mbukati, who is in Lilongwe in Malawi. Uh, managed to, I've known him for years, first met him on this, you know, teacher exchange in 2013. And we finally managed to get in chat to each other. And uh, he WhatsApped from his car, pulled over the side, WhatsApp from his car. We managed to have a oh, chat wow. and record it. Um, and when I asked him, Jeremy, about what word, he would like to come up with for you 
to kind of talk about for 30 seconds and maybe link it geographically. Such a lovely word. Perhaps he was feeling it towards the end of the chat. Was love. Oh, that is... (laughs) Isn't that a lovely word? Okay, so I wrote my list, and that's my middle word of my one word. That- <laughs> that that's is no kidding. Funny, no kidding, that everybody. So- I know you hate when people do that. It's like, oh, I was really, I was really going to call you. No, really, I wrote it down on my index card, and that's my second word. Yeah, so seriously, love. Everybody. Oh my gosh, that, that, was so like, that was almost like a magic trick. It's like, <laughs> so what word are you thinking of right now? I know. Funny enough, here it is in this card. Oh, that's <laughs> so interesting. It's love. Yeah. And um, Jeremy, so yes. are you ready for 30 yes. seconds to talk, however you so wish, geographically, preferably, but doesn't have to be, about the word love? Yes, I'm ready. So, so um, off you go. Okay. Love. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is that I love what I do. I love the uh, experiences that I have because geography and there are the sciences are really the only disciplines that have camaraderie, commun- you know, that communication, that dialect, that discussion, the hands-on, and that when you have that ability for appreciation of the world that we live in, you can't help but help love what you do and where you are. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. We do, don't we? I don't know what it is. I mean, okay. It's it's, it's it will be a bit pretentious to say that oh yeah only geographers love what they do of course there's tons of people out there who love what they do but i don't know i just having this geography background to everything i do just makes me feel i can get myself in love with more things right because i can get into i can get deeper connected to things i can i've said it in the past i can look at a tree and not just see a tree i can see a whole entire micro ecosystem you know what the roots do what the leaves do how it feeds how it nurtures how it breaks up the soil and it just ah oh, it just fills me with awe and love yeah so well because it opens when my students ask me the definition of geography i always say first it's the word why yeah. And they're like, what do you mean? Why? I'm like, why are the mountains here? Why do we live here? Why is there water? Why is there weather? Why is there climate? Why is it hot? Why is it cold? You know, and all these things that you want to know all come back around to geography. And, yeah. and there's nothing that you cannot pull in to that. I mean, it's it's forever. <laughs> Everybody, right. Listen to it right now. If I say two things from this point onwards that paying your privilege forward and Geography is the question why to anything. I've magpied that from Jeremy. <laughs> Both of those things. <laughs> credit, credit, thank you, I appreciate Jeremy it. Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, I'm going to make mentions of that in previous in future podcasts, and I'll be saying, yeah. So season two, episode blah blah blah. It was Jeremy that came up with that. You should listen to it. So, yeah. brilliant. Right before I forget, because I have forgotten in the past, and I admit everybody, I've had to like re-record and get people back on and say we forgot to talk about your word. <laughs> before I forget, <laughs> Jeremy, what word would you like to <laughs> pay forward to <laughs> next week's guest? Um, well, sorry, well, that's so funny. So we got my loved. first one, which was <laughs> smells smells yes mm-hmm. we're going with one of the senses people we're going with yeah. one of the senses um talk about senses one of my favorite ones was actually speaking about Ro proctor again she came up with the word toenail and it was half comical Ooh. half serious and then tawny so in the following episode absolutely nailed it nailed it like talking about how your feet connect with the earth and how your toes mm. can collect the dirt and that dirt carries around the the soil and i was like oh my god this is so fun. so yeah i'm looking forward to this one anything to do with the senses they seem yeah. to be winners <laughs> that was funny the love one I, I just can't get over that that was <laughs> and, it, and it brilliant that that from these words we're not very, we're not separated by that many degrees of separation geography no. means we're not separated by very many degrees of separation all right. Um, do you have anyone you'd like to say hi to? Students? <laughs> oh, anyone. I mean, I'm just so uh, thankful for an opportunity to have a conversation about just what what we're doing uh, here in academia. So yeah. uh, I guess instead of saying hello or th- just more of a thank you, and I'm looking forward to hearing from anyone. You know, I'm like, I'm very... Uh, 
I started a YouTube channel for my classes and I'm getting comments from people around the world about certain videos and topics and things like that. And, and I love it. I love it because I'm creating these conversations with people that I never in a million years thought I would have been able to connect with over topics and things that I'm passionate about and that maybe they are as well. And so yeah. I guess more than anything is I'm really, I'm more, I guess it's more of a hello. I'm excited to create that conversation with people that uh, are listening and that uh, are going to share this with us. Perfect. And that leads me perfect into tell us about you, your YouTube channel. Where do we find it? What's, what's the channel's name? So you can look it up by my name, um, but it's Professor Patrick but, or Jeremy Patrick. It's the first thing that pops up. It, it confuses people because it's like <laughs> two, almost 300 videos of lectures on California history and geology and geomorphology. Oh my God, and, I'm not going to go to sleep tonight. And then there's field trip videos where we've gone out in the field. Like I take students on my uh, bristlecone pine, which is one of the oldest living trees in the world. And so yeah. I've got that. And then I've got a whole bunch of Disney stuff. I won't tell anyone else um, <laughs> that I, I share on there as well. And then I get to talk about. And and so it's very diverse. Like I've got um, – you know, like for my, I teach a world regional geography. So I've tried to like to connect pieces of things that I have in my collection that I can share. So like when we talk about Germany, I've got a piece of the Berlin Wall and I, I get to talk about that. And, you know, for nice. many people who live near there, it's not, you know, they, it's a big deal, but it's not, you know, it's like, that's yeah, cool. But for my students, it's different because it's so far away from them. They think it's a different world and a different, it's, it's in a history book. It must be so old, it doesn't exist anymore. And it's been a fun <laughs> way to connect that way. Uh, so, right. If I'm thinking this, people are not going to forgive me if I don't ask you this, right? We can get the opportunity now, even though we should be signing off. <laughs> give us give, quickly, quickly, give us one example of how you've used Disney within your teaching, how you've made, used it geographically. Oh, you you must have done, oh, surely. Yes. Well, I well. Good. Okay. You got like oh, you're three seconds. Me. Oh, you're stressing me out. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I just good to go back with culture. It's like something that I've talked about a lot is women in animation and how they're a group of yeah. people at the beginning that did not have a voice. And now that they do because of a beautiful woman, smart, her name is uh, Mindy Johnson, who put together the first ever massive book on women of animation. So how do we talk about the importance of, of other people that were involved in our childhood, our parents' childhood, and then our children's childhood and that's that awareness. And so I, that's an example of how I would, I did actually do a tour at Walt Disney studios with my students where I talk Sweet. about it. I walk not in just Walt's footsteps, but in the women's footsteps that were there. And so there's lots of ways you can tie this all in. And that's what makes yeah. it enjoyable. Yeah. And yeah, and so many of us at teachers like we'll use popular culture within our teaching so much, you know, because it's such a great in to thing that kids are relevant to. My one of my favorite things I used to do was um, use episodes of The Simpsons um, to about you know when they go traveling around the world as a way of dispelling myths and stereotypes because mm -hmm. obviously they they exaggerate stereotypes and so we use it to say okay spot the stereotypes stereotypes you know brazil is nothing like this uk is nothing like this right how did you feel after this episode about the uk did you feel a bit stereotyped did you feel a bit it just love that kind of stuff you know so and it was just an excuse to watch the simpsons in lessons you know so hey it's a other cartoons are available <laughs> They are, but that one, you know, you're absolutely correct with that. That's just, it's a great way to something well, as I've gotten older, like South Park, I've now sort of rewatching it <laughs> thinking, wow, I don't remember this being so edgy as, as it was <laughs> when I was a kid. And, you know, and being aware of the social and political issues that were at that time and what we're dealing yeah. with now, you know, it, it, and awkwardly, it makes you appreciate it more because you understand the full story, you know, and so then in, when you understand the full story, you can see the right and the wrong that was within that episode or that story. But until you understand the whole thing, you, I don't think you can really appreciate, appreciate it. And that's with anything, right? You know, when you can yeah. understand it all, uh, it connects it together. And then you can, you know, it's like, I'm not, you know, I'm not a bad person because I like Disney because I understand and I acknowledge the different things that were done at the time, but the people that were involved, the voices and, and what the intent might have been then versus what it is now and how we can acknowledge it, understand it, and then be better. And yeah. how can we be better about it now? And, you know, there's always more nuance than we always realize with these things as well. No, of course. Um, Jeremy, I could speak to you all night. I've, you know, <laughs> seriously, it is, uh, you know, we're eight hours later on than you um i know i'm sorry it's lunch it's lunch time for me so what I'm you apologize for this is amazing this would be perfectly a cool reason to stay up all night and talk to you and i think everybody listening 
it is agree with me this is a great listen um jeremy thanks so much for giving up your time um and yeah hopefully we'll keep in touch and everybody i'm definitely gonna do check out jeremy's youtube channel because it sounds amazing thank you jeremy and uh, keep in touch thank you and i cannot wait for another chance to speak with you again absolutely thank you so much for listening we hope you had fun if you haven't already done so please subscribe so more stories and experiences can drop into your favorite podcast app if you fancy being a guest or have any feedback follow us on twitter at coffee jog pod and send us a dm or you could email coffee and jog at geogramblings.com until next time keep geogging